In this lecture, we'll survey modernism as well as contexts for reading Robert Frost and William Carlos Williams. While Romanticism and Realism are aesthetic movements that have many generational differences and variations, making it difficult at times to apply an overarching definition, Modernism pushes these boundaries even further. To begin with, to be clear, we should be aware that there is a difference between the Modern Age as an historical period and Modernism as an aesthetic movement. The Modern Age, history, begins with the Renaissance, or early modern history, and extends through the 20th century, and it includes a vast array of changes in religion, education, social mobility, governmental structures, urbanization, the sciences, technology, industrialization, and so forth, all allowing us to rethink the ideas of faith and social and cosmic order, upon which cultures were largely reliant up to and through the medieval period. Modernism as an aesthetic movement is a time of focused re-examination and experimentation. A textbook way to approach the movement is to begin with Ezra Pound's modernist motto, Make it new, and other critics have indeed defined it as a tradition of the new. With this in mind, the possibilities for modern art are understandably immense. If you've encountered modernism before, you've probably already been familiarized with the generic themes common to modernism, which include feelings of loss, fragmentation, and alienation. These are all anxieties that modernists addressed in response to the many rapid changes occurring in the early 20th century regarding industrialization, urbanization, and of course, war. In fact, Gertrude Stein's well-known phrase, the lost generation, refers to those modernists who came of age during World War I, for instance, F. Scott Fitzgerald, T.S. Eliot, John Steinbeck, William Faulkner, and Ezra Pound. Literature of the renowned lost generation often revolves around a sense of disorientation, disconnect, and alienation that resulted from war experiences as well as a general sense of lack of belonging. For Americans, World War I comes only 50 years after the bloodiest war in our history, the Civil War, and while World War I did not result in as many deaths, adding up to over 100,000 Americans lost on the battlefield, it still served to underscore the absurdities of modern civilization, poison gas and motorized armaments, products of mass society that were supposed to make war more efficient, indeed resulted more efficiently in mass destruction. Modernism is not limited to its reflections on the war, however. Beyond this, modernists are known experimentalists. They often mix together different traditional and new modes, risking incoherence in order to challenge the audience's preconceptions of the known world. To this end, some turned to classical works of the past, looking for new ways to revivify and challenge traditional values while others emphasized international awareness and cultural representation. Many Americans traveled in the early 20th century. Such was made possible by the devastation wreaked upon European countries during the wars, which made travel for Americans cheaper. But some modernists, objecting to the illusions of patriotism demanded of America's citizens, expatriated to other countries. In any case, such study and experience allowed modernists to move temporally and spatially in their art. In some ways, modernism can even be seen as a striving towards a democratic form of art, seeking to liberate audiences of the strictures upheld by traditional hierarchies like patriarchy and white superiority. Some modernists celebrated indigenous cultures, while others sought to decenter America's sense of importance in the world by introducing more global perspectives. Yet, at the same time, some modernists felt that such celebration of simple folk views lent to the narrowness of mind and the dangerous conservatism that should best be left a relic of the past. Thus, these artists focused on freer expression of sexual and political matters, responding to such restrictive laws like the ones that prohibited the dissemination of information about birth control, or that charged teachers of evolution with corrupting the youth. In fact, many think that the time of civil resistance in America only really begins with the 1960s. But the early 20th century sees the seed of this active resentment take root against state power as many modernists expressed support for outcasts, renegades, and victims of the system. Thus, while some modernists readdressed traditional modes and thought, others sought to move beyond them, and thus we also see a general migration away from the regionalism and local color of late 19th century and early 20th century realist literature, especially in order to give more attention and awareness to an increasingly urbanized consciousness. At the extreme end of this, rather than promote itself as a democratic art, modernists could be seen as extremely elitist, especially when they argued that only a few could truly understand the esoteric insights of modern art. 
This is in part demonstrated by modernists who sought to challenge the concept of art. Let's turn to Duchamp for a quick familiar example. In 1917, Marcel Duchamp put his infamous fountain on display. Fountain is just a urinal bought from a store, turned upside down, and signed R. Mutt. It has been variously interpreted as distasteful and or revolutionary because it defies, on one hand, the traditional definition of art as something one crafts, as well as, on the other hand, the traditional concept of art as something that should be ennobling. Here, instead, Duchamp presents a mass-produced, ready-made product that makes art of human waste. One could read this as an attempt to shock the audience out of the deadening, desensitizing elements of everyday urban industrial life, perhaps even to reinvigorate it. But in any case, to this day, it is still debated whether Duchamp's fountain should count as art. And in this way, it helps to demonstrate how modernists can at times be seen as elitist. We could also see Duchamp's art as an expression of the modernist fascination with big business, due to its origins in the factory, a chief feature of early 20th century America. And this leads us to another face of modernism which sought to move away from high art and high culture towards instead low art and low culture or in other words, popular culture, art that is made for the lowest common denominator and or is disseminated for the widest audience, including venues made for the masses such as newspapers and radio. Many modernists worked as journalists and screenwriters in the early 20th century. Here, Duchamp gives elitist high modernism a twist by using for his subject a product of low culture, something that is mass produced. In this way, he brings in a classic sense of irony common in modernist art. On the other end of this spectrum are those who try to challenge our preconceptions of the world as familiar. This is not to redefine the margins and edges of our world conception, but to redefine that which falls in the center of our world conception. And this particular goal is sometimes achieved by focusing on the extremely ordinary and mundane scenes, people, and objects of everyday life, from fishermen to wheelbarrows. We will begin our modernism unit with Robert Frost and William Carlos Williams. Frost may be seen as an author moving towards modernism, while Williams has been seen as a central modernist. Both are part of the poetic renaissance, which is a modernist movement that seeks to revive American poetry as poetry for the American people. The beginning of the poetic renaissance is marked by Harriet Monroe's publication of Poetry, a magazine of verse, which ended up attracting both major and minor modernists, publishing T.S. Eliot, Wallace Stevens, H.D., Ezra Pound, Amy Lowell, Robert Frost, William Carlos Williams, D.H. Lawrence, and more. Her magazine championed the idea that, as she said, quote, poetry may not be a grand enough portal, and the lamps that light it may burn dim in drifting winds. But until a nobler one is built, it should stand, and its little lights should show the way as they can. Robert Frost is known for his persona as a New England farmer poet, but he was actually born in San Francisco and didn't move east until he was 11, at which point he spent the rest of his adolescence in Lawrence, Massachusetts, which was an industrial mill town. He finally moved to a farm for a short while when he was 26, then after a little over a decade he picked up his wife and kids and moved to England where he met several Georgian poets, that is, those poets in Britain that come after the Victorian age and before Britain's modernism. They were typically highly criticized by America's own high modernists, just as Frost himself has been seen as a proto-modern or more traditional poet rather than an actual modernist. Before England, Frost had been a teacher. However, in England, and with the encouragement of Ezra Pound, a well-known modernist, he was able to launch his career in poetry. He adopted rural New England life as his subject matter, and he published his first two books in London before they appeared in America. In 1915, he returned to America. Britain had declared war on Germany, and about six months after this, Frost, 40 years old at the time, uprooted his wife and kids once more and sought refuge in New Hampshire, where it would be another two years before America joined the war. Although he did not fight in the war, he was not wholly untouched. While in England, he had established a close friendship with the critic Edward Thomas, a man whose recognition had helped launch Ezra Pound's career. And when he moved back to America, he took Thomas's son with him, the idea being that the rest of the Thomas family would follow shortly after. However, Thomas was a man of indecision and ended up joining the war, ultimately dying in France in 1917. According to Frost, his well-known poem, The Road Not Taken, is a reflection on Thomas. Frost reached notoriety upon returning to America. He became a poet in residence at the University of Michigan and other colleges, won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1924, 1931, 1937, and 1943, 
A mountain in Vermont was named after him in 1955, and in 1961 he was invited to read a poem at JFK's inaugural ceremony. His time in the backcountry of New England gave him opportunity to study rural life, and for many, his poetry is defined by what appears to be provincial ideas. For instance, natural scenes, fear of change, distrust of technology, pride in craftsmanship, and a romantic commitment to self-reliance or individualism, most of which appears to have little in common with his experimental modernist contemporaries. Moreover, whereas modernists tended to use free verse, he typically wrote using traditional rhymes and metrical forms like sonnets and blank verse. His conception of the role of a poet may appear conservative for the time as well. In his essay, The Figure a Poem Makes, he explained that a poem begins, quote, in delight and ends in wisdom. It runs a course of lucky events and ends in a clarification of life. Not necessarily a great clarification, such as sex and cults are founded on, but in a momentary stay against confusion. We'll be looking at his dark poems, which consider the limitations, confusion, vulnerabilities, and isolation of the individual. In 1913, William Carlos Williams attended the Armory Show, the first large exhibition of modernist art in America where he stumbled upon Marcel Duchamp's renowned Nude Descending a Staircase No. 2, a painting that abstracts the rhythmic movements of a woman descending a staircase. He stood face to face with this work and laughed out loud, partially in response to Duchamp's irreverence and partially at himself, surprised by his own recognition. Although he seemed to appreciate Duchamp's work and is considered a central figure in modernism, we might say he falls somewhere between the canonical high modernists of Pound and Eliot and the more traditional proto-modernists like Frost. Unlike other modernists like Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot who expatriated, Williams spent most of his life in New Jersey. Similar to Frost, Williams considered himself a poet of America and was convinced that he should remain in America and write on issues for Americans. He spent some time abroad studying in Paris with his younger brother and came back to America deciding on a career in medicine in order to support his real passion, writing. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School in 1906, he went abroad again, visited Pound in London, and traveled the continent. His cultural background was mixed. His mother was born in Puerto Rico and was of Basque, French, Dutch, and Jewish descent. His father was born in England and raised in the West Indies. The family spoke Spanish at home and his father made frequent business trips to Latin and South America. All this lent Williams with an appreciation for cultural diversity. Meanwhile, his experiences as a physician among the poor middle classes shaped the scenes and characters in his works. He's particularly known for his imagism. Imagism is a reaction against what modernists perceived as the stilted styles of Victorian and Georgian poetry, poetry that limits itself to traditional syntax and structured rhythms, as well as full of ornamentation and sentiment. Instead, imagists strove to put forth poetry that was as straightforward as possible, to use the exact word necessary to present the image, not a word that is nearly exact, or metaphorical, or cliché, and to use an organic rather than contrived rhythm that speaks for the true individuality of the image and poet. The image itself must be concrete and specific, no generalizations allowed here, and the image should evoke an immediate feeling or mood for the reader. The image itself must carry an instantaneous intellectual and emotional response. But an image does not represent an idea. That is, it's not supposed to be a symbol in that the image is not representative of an idea, but contains the idea itself. And it's not impressionistic in that the image truly is as it is represented, rather than a subjective approximation. In imagism, poetry should also be free of moralizing. It should not evoke ideas about the thing, but simply present the image itself. Another way to think of all this is to understand the image as the combination of the thing and its idea. The thing is the tangible element, what you see, hear, or otherwise perceive through your senses, and the idea is the intangible element, what you perceive in your mind's eye. But rather than think of the idea and the thing that evokes that idea or represents that idea as separable, imagism thinks of them as inseparable. Thus, the image as a whole instantaneously presents the thing and idea at once to a reader and neither idea or thing precedes the other. Thus, in form, imagist poetry is typically highly compressed, it typically uses common language, and it typically relies on a kind of musical free verse, a rhythm that helps to express the mood, but one that doesn't necessarily follow pre-established or traditional rules of poetic form. In response to imagism, some have argued that the images speak to the high modernist emphasis on fragments, imagist poetry giving just a fragment of an experience or perception, and thus disallowing a sense of continuity. Imagist poetry also insists upon the reader participating in the creation of the poem, 
as a modernist act, defying the central authority of authors and instead decentralizing authority into the readers.